Hey everyone, and welcome to another video. I'm super excited to be here today with Alan and Dave from Apex Growth. Uh, I've been seeing their ads everywhere and they're pushing something very cool, which is working with enterprise level brands. Apex Growth has worked with brands like TransUnion, Paramount, and Shopify, and they have a really cool method and framework for helping people transition from the small business space into more of these enterprise level clients that have much bigger tickets and can pay you up to $100,000 a month or more just for managing their campaigns and helping them grow their business. So Dave, Alan, thanks for being here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah. thank you. So, I know there's a lot of people that are really excited for many aspects of this interview, but I think where I wanted to start is just how you got started, Dave, and bring us to today where you're at now. Yeah, I think going back, this is uh, many years ago, back in 20, uh, 2007, that's when Facebook came out with their self-serve platform. And I was a programmer at the time, and I decided to search for how to make money online. And I found a whole bunch of people making a lot of money on Facebook at the time. And so I started getting really immersed in these groups that were people who were making money online and so I ended up just staying up late from my day job, testing things, trying things on Facebook and learning how to grind and make uh, Facebook work. So eventually I became profitable on Facebook as an affiliate marketer. And this was the very beginning of my agency journey. So I think the biggest learning here is to just, you know, if you have something going on, try something at night, try something on the weekends. And eventually that may evolve into something much bigger. So in the agency world, I was doing the same thing. I was working my day jobs as a marketer. And then at night I was helping other clients with different types of businesses. And so so didn't really intend to start an agency, but as I was networking and learning and, and talking to a lot of people, so many people were coming for me asking for help that I ended up quitting my day job and starting an agency full time. And the rest is history. Love it. So 2007 affiliate marketing on the, you know, those were like the real OG days of Facebook. Hard to imagine what ads manager would have looked like back then. Remarkably not that much different, which is <laughs> kind of, kind of sad. <laughs> Surprisingly, <laughs> that, yeah, that does not surprise me. It was the wild wild west of like five cent clicks and you could get pretty much any ad approved it was pretty wild but I learned That's a lot cool. by doing that back then. Love it. So give us more detail on that. You were doing affiliate marketing, became profitable there. How did you make the transition to an agency and what were the types of clients you were working with then? Yeah, so I was basically doing Facebook marketing full-time from about 2007 to about 2011, 2012. Mm -hmm. And then around that time, actually Facebook became really difficult to make money with because it was saturated with a lot of other affiliates who were copying each other and kind of doing their, doing their thing. So I ended up going and working as a marketer for, some of the people uh, that I was actually doing affiliate marketing for. And that's when I realized that there are so many companies that need help with Facebook marketing and Google ads and anything related to acquisition. But that's really where I got my start with helping companies at night and essentially getting too many clients to actually do my day job and you know run this agency full time. You know, getting those clients was a largely because of networking and really just being a good person and being helpful to a lot of people. I hadn't experienced expected this to happen. But over the years, just like meeting people at, at conferences and, you know, being part of forums, you know, really led me to meet so many people and then, you know, start uh, working with some of the some of the larger companies as well. Love that. So you were still working your day job as a programmer all throughout the affiliate marketing process and these kind of first freelance clients that you had. Yeah. So okay. as a programmer doing marketing and, you know, it was long days, long weekends, but, you know, as, as an entrepreneur, I'm sure you can relate. Keaton is that, you know, you got to grind. Like if you really want to get what you want, you got to put in the time. Um, now with a, a wife and two kids, I don't exactly work that hard uh, uh -huh. as, as I used to, but I really think that grinding as much as possible, again, on nights and weekends, even if you have a day job, that's going to unlock the ability to, you know, have more freedom in the future. Yeah. Lay that foundation. That's great. So who was your first client? So actually, I got a little lucky because of the networking that I had done in the affiliate space. So back in 2016, my first client actually was a people search company called Spokio that's still around. And I had met them through some networking. And then I ended up working with Pluto TV. Um, the co-founder of, of that reached out to me. This is back in 2017. They're actually still a client uh, under the umbrella of Paramount. And then cool. a, a friend of mine that I worked with like three years before that 
that, he started a, a leadership position at Ring.com, which was acquired by Amazon later. So all in a matter of about a year, it was Spokio, Ring, Pluto TV, Fox, and actually TransUnion as well. So, you know, I can go into the stories about those big brands because I did learn a lot about closing them. Um, I had some kind of smaller clients that you hadn't heard of before then. But early on, I was already working with big brand clients just because of the networking and, and, you know, presence I had put up online. Got it. And yeah, I mean, at that point, like if you were one of the founding members of, you know, using Facebook ads manager, <laughs> you can't go any farther back. <laughs> so I'm sure that that they were referring to you as an absolute expert in that place. What were you selling them? Was it just Facebook ads or? Yes, Facebook ads and Google ads pretty much. And so, you know, I, I think one big learning there is that those are still very important things to know. And, you know, every a lot of companies want to work with companies that, that can acquire users on Facebook and Google. One thing we did learn, though, is that, you know, in closing these bigger brands, and I wish I had known this back at the time, is leading with something beyond that kind of standard media buying is really the way to go. Because a lot of these big companies, they have Facebook buyers or they have Google buyers internally. And so what you want to do is give them something that is kind of related to that, but not exactly that. So an example is we lead with creative strategy a lot. And creative Creative strategy is really just the process of getting outsized wins on Facebook or Google. And you're so you're still actually buying on Facebook and Google. But if you say, hey, we can actually help you with your creative strategy, just a, very much related to media buying, the, the, the clients that we found say, actually, we do need that because we don't have anybody working on our creative process, our creative strategy, onboarding agencies, onboarding, you know, uh, working with designers, et cetera. So that's really what we're learning now is that media buying is kind of a commodity. You know, I've been doing Facebook ads for 15 years. It's like you got to lead with something else now. And so that's one been one big learning that we've had. That's really cool. And the creative strategy, when you say that, like you're coming up with, you know, 10 or 15 ad ideas and the designs for those or videos for those and presenting them to the company and then they're choosing which ones to run or how exactly does that work? Yeah, there's a few different flavors of it, but that's one. So, you know, we, we like to think there's ideation. So coming up with the concepts and really thinking through, you know, what may work. We have a lot of visibility because we see a lot, what, what's working with a lot of different clients. Um, the other piece is writing creative briefs. So that's really a, a description, a document that we've really nailed down to describe exactly what the production or the process after that would be. And so let's think of that as kind of like your instruction guide or template that you're delivering a creative production person to go create that creative. And then, you know, so you've got the ideation, you've got the creative brief, then you got the design and working with the designers to help create. And then there's the launch of the creative. And then there's looking at the stats and iterating and and having that feedback loop. When I was working at Fox uh, as a client, um, as a, a media buyer for them, uh, as a consultant, I would go in, in house there uh, here in Los Angeles, and I would meet with the user acquisition guys and the creative production people. And what I noticed is that there was no feedback loop between the step, like the conversion rate or the CTR or a CPA on Facebook and the designers. So I ended up creating templates with my now co-founder David, and we would basically communicate stats on Facebook to the designer. Such a simple thing, but the designers had no idea how these things were performing. So that is kind of creating that feedback loop, which we do in our own creative process. And so it's really just, you know, start to finish ideation, creative briefing, working with the production, getting them launched and iterating, and then feeding, having that feedback loop all around. And I bet you most of the people listening to this that are agency owners, I bet you their clients are not doing this. And this is a huge way to actually get into new companies as an agency, but also upsell your existing clients too. Yeah. It really makes a lot of sense because like you were saying media buy being a commodity it's not just a commodity like it's the easiest part like you literally just plug in like common sense targeting you put in the creative you put the ads in and like you click publish right like yep. It's not that hard. And for every like fancy media buying trick, you should probably be putting in 10 to 20 hours of thought on the creative itself rather than like trying to figure out some fancy thing when yeah, it comes right. to the, the media buying itself. Yeah, you're absolutely right, by the way. And it's it's honestly gotten even easier than I mean, you, yeah. you made it sound very easy. <laughs> like 10 years ago, it was a yeah. lot more complicated. Ads manager yeah. was way clunky, which you alluded to earlier. And but now it's like, especially with Google app campaigns, formerly Google UAC and then Facebook AAA ads, like that's all you do. You just dump in the creative set your bid, your budget, you don't even set your bid, and then you're targeting maybe location, that's it, and let it run. And so really where you should be spending your effort is not on the media buying, spend money or spend time on the creative process. Look at the creative, figure out how to come up with better creative concepts. We have a process of rotating our creative from a what we call a sandbox to a BAU, business as usual mm -hmm. campaign. We have a very specific
specific process that we execute for our clients and that we teach. So that's where you should be spending your time. So you're absolutely right. Yeah, I love that. So nowadays you guys are closing, obviously big brands like this, and eventually you're getting to these contracts that are sometimes six figures a month, but you don't always start out that way, right? Yeah, I think the biggest learning there, uh, we call it the land and expand strategy. Okay. There's a couple of things is, I mean, first of all, to close these big brands, you know, there might be some people listening thinking, okay, well, I'm just starting out. So like, I don't really have that network. So first of all, you will want to be doing networking, whether it's posting on LinkedIn or, you know, doing your thing on YouTube, which is great. Like just have a channel mm. uh, where you're posting a lot of content and getting your name out there. That's something you should just be doing regularly to meet them. I actually met an agency owner the other day who is on TikTok and I'm not, I'm not on TikTok maybe because I'm an old guy. I don't know, but, <laughs> uh, but he was posting on TikTok all his Facebook campaign successes and use cases. And I was like, and that's how he actually gets clients. He gets hundred percent of his clients on, on TikTok. And I was like, okay. he's putting out content, which is great. So that's one. Second thing is, you know, yeah, having a channel, like, you know, your, your YouTube presence is really good. Like you need a presence, you need, whether it be a website or a channel, you need to fill that out and look like you're active because these big clients, they will stalk you and they will go to all of your profiles. And if you don't look like you're buttoned up, then you're not going to be able to close the deal. I have one story on that actually with Fox, the guy that was working in house at, at Fox. He's like, so I go to your LinkedIn and you have a company called Rockbox Media, which is like this name I made up as an affiliate just because I need a, a media company. And he's like, the executives here, like, we've never heard of that. We don't know what that is. Who are you? So I wanted to be in user acquisition. So um, a friend of mine who bought datascience.com and sold that to Oracle sometime later, uh, he's a fraternity brother of mine. He was like, if you want to own the space, get the domain name. And so I ended up spending a lot of time and eventually acquired useracquisition.com. cost me $23,000. And that's a negotiation was a hell of a, another story. But <laughs> I got that domain. I put up a website and I went back to the guy at Fox and I was like, okay, I've got useracquisition.com. This is my company. He's like, okay, that'll work. We took that to the executives. We created a deck. And so, you know, and then closed the deal and ended up working with them for two and a half years. So having that presence, whether it be through a channel, a website, a domain or something is something of the keys to closing bigger clients. Yeah, I love that. It's like the stuff that doesn't matter for local business, really. Like they local business does want to work with Rockbox Media, right? Like they're not going to care. But when you level up, like, okay, the domain name does matter now. The design of the website does matter. And that's, you know, nothing against somebody running it. Uh, agency in the local space, but if you want to take it higher, the stuff that you, you intuitively know does matter to massive clients will really matter in that case. Great advice there. Absolutely. And I, I think what else, the other thing you said that stuck out to me, like there's this epidemic where everybody thinks that prospecting has to be the way that they get clients. Like they don't understand that inbound is a thing and networking and referrals is a thing. And it's all about this like scarcity, like how do I get a client today? Instead of thinking, long-term, how can I build a reputation for myself so that the clients come to me? And you not even really having an agency set up yet, were able to get clients like that because of the reputation you built up your, for yourself in the affiliate marketing space and just the skills you had. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think the challenge that some people, when they hear this is like, this does take time. You know, the inbound piece is not overnight. You know, if yeah. you want to go out and prospect, do outbound, you might be able to find things quicker in some cases, but if you really want the bigger brands, you do need to spend that time investing in not only your, your presence, but, you know, I was spending a lot of time going to conferences, honestly, going to conferences a little bit to party and just meet people and just have yeah. a good time, but, you know, other affiliates. And that's how really how I learned their tricks and, and all those tactics. But I, I wish that I had done that earlier. I wish that I'd also met more experts in the space and like, you know, learned from people like me, for example, where, you know, if I had known all the things I know now back then, I would have not made the mistakes like leading with media buying all the time instead of creative strategy. Or another mistake I made was I was trying to close like annual contracts with these guys that didn't know who I was. And so I ended up getting more deals by doing month to month contracts just to get my foot in the door and then expanding them over time with additional services. And I know a lot of people don't like month to month contracts. I mean, but it's much easier to close. That's how I closed Ringing. That's how I closed Snapchat. Box was like a three month contract going month to month. But, you know, just getting my foot in the door those ways, I, I just wish I had known that from from somebody like me honestly you know yeah yeah i love that i feel like the number one hack that i found for just shaking things up like elevating my mindset finding tricks that you can't really find online is just going to networking events for lack of a better word but like conferences and you know i was just at one last 
week and like I had totally written off this is random but like credit card hacking like travel hacking through credit card points and things like that and I talked to this guy and he's like well you know all the really good stuff it's gone underground and like it's not being shared and so he told me some of the strategies he's using I was like that is absolutely insane and that's the same kind of stuff that you can get even if it's not you know like underground so to speak some of the best people at their craft aren't out there making content but they are at these events and if you can get yourself in the right rooms there's things that just click that like oh this makes so much more sense now and like those have been some of the biggest breakthroughs in my business so absolutely that's been the same for you yeah affiliate summit west and east were big mobile apps unlocked ad tech were the what were some of the ones that you were going to i'm actually pretty new like i've i've done in the last year high level i'm really into high level i love that community so i went to two of their events and then this one that i just mentioned was just like a smaller meetup like 50 people financial independence one so that was really cool i think the small meetups i think Mm -hmm. are probably some of the most valuable of getting like-minded people in a room where they're comfortable sharing and maybe maybe don't even record it so they can tell you their secrets but i mean i've i've made a good chunk of money in the past just being at those events and talking to people and to your point about the credit card hacks like i was getting like oh post this on facebook at this hour because you're more likely to get approved and then use this type of landing page copy change it i mean there was some shady stuff going on back then but uh i mean you know those little hacks taught me so much about just testing 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 and trying things and you know it it worked out pretty well yeah it's so cool you're not going to learn that kind of stuff just sitting at your house you know yeah for sure so talk to me about you know you got these first few contracts. You're still kind of moonlighting, trying to figure this all out. Fast forward to now, you guys have a pretty substantial team, a really good reputation in the space and lots of systems around what you're doing. Tell me from a personal perspective, how that journey went when your co-founders came on board, what the team looks like now, et cetera. Yeah. So when I started out, I was basically capped out on my time. I had my day job and I was working a couple of clients at night. And so I met my co-founder who at the time was also had a, a full-time gig, but I was like, hey, do you want to help me on one of these projects? And this is back in 2018, 2019. Mm-hmm. And he's like, sure. And so we were basically moonlighting together. And then we realized, again, we started getting more inbound and just, it was partially inbound, but I was doing some outbound as well. And at that point, you know, our schedules were just so full. And so I then realized, okay, how about this? I'm going to make a rule. For every new client that we close, we're going to bring on at least one person to help us out with that. So like, let's not be greedy. Let's not try to collect all the revenue ourselves. The math I usually did was on a 10K contract, I would try to basically siphon off 25 to 33% to hire a contractor or somebody to help me out with that. And we stuck with that rule for quite a while. And so every client that we closed, you know, part of me, I was like, okay, well, let's just keep the 10K and we can just work a few extra hours. I'm like, nope. This is not going to be scalable. Like if we don't start bringing on people to help us with these Mm. things, then we're just going to drive ourselves crazy, you know? So we kept doing that. And then, you know, this again was like how the agency was born. It was really weird is that we got three or four more clients and then we had three or four contractors and then we converted one of the contractors to a full-time person. And then another contractor came on board. And at that point, this is like 2019. I think we had about five people and we really, again, didn't consider ourselves an agency. That's not what we set out to do. But a digital marketing agency was the best way to describe what we were doing. And that made the most sense to kind of create. Uh, it was actually customeracquisition.com uh, back then. We rebranded with Alan's help to Apex Growth. And you know nowadays, we've got about 15 different people working on a variety of different clients. We're all remote all over the US. Alan's in Seattle. I'm in LA. My co-founder's in Denver. We got people in San Francisco, New York, you know, everywhere. And it's a good situation. I think that I'm really happy that it evolved to where it is, but I still do feel like we're we're just getting started here. So. Yeah, I love how incremental you described it. Like it doesn't have to be this massive strategy jump to like, I'm only taking big clients and I have to, you know, dress up in a suit every day now and do this. Like it could just be one client here, hire a contractor to help out with that. If they do a good job, see if that's a, a full-time thing eventually. It's yeah, cool how it's evolved for you. Yeah. And the incremental aspect also applies to our land and expand strategy. So a couple mm-hmm. of examples 
to that is like, um, I won't name some of these companies, uh, but you know, when we started out, like our 5k contract would eventually get to 10 to 20 a month by selling them services starting month to month. And every time you can expand your contract, you could also reset it to like another three month or another six months as well. So I liked for the, for, if you're just starting out to start month to month, just cause it's easier to get your foot in the door, just handle that objection right away. Like, Hey, you know, we'll perform. And if not, you know, you can let us go and, you know, halfway good at, you can probably keep it going. But then a couple of the other enterprise guys, I mean, we would start out, there was one that we started out at 40 K a month and then expanded that to 135. And then last year, one was at 70 K a month. And then we did a good job and then over tripled that to, to 215, which is our biggest deal. And so, you know, just really just getting your foot in the door. I know this, those numbers are big, like getting your foot in the door for 70 K is not bad, but you know, <laughs> Like that was just smaller kind of focus scope. And then yeah. we showed them that, okay, we're just doing Facebook and Google and a couple other channels, but if you want to invest in creative strategy and you want to invest in reporting and analytics and you, and you know, we can also help you with conversion optimization. They, they start to understand, they see how good we're doing on the media buying side. They're like, okay, well, let's tack on those other services. And you could also do it for, you know, three or six months or keep it month to month. And they'll have a hard time saying no with month to month, you know? Yeah, I love that. It wasn't always like that, right? I mean, I remember when I joined, when you guys reached out to me when I was at Amazon, I think you guys were charging like when in the early days, you guys were charging lower fees, lower retainers, and you kind of had to work your way up to being gaining that confidence to be able to charge, you know, these, these higher numbers, like 40, 50 K MRRs. Can, can you tell a little bit more about kind of like when you and David were starting out, like, you know, you, how, how you kind of had to grow into getting more out of your fees? Yeah. Well, I will say on the, uh, I give you credit, Alan, because, you know, he persuaded me to, to charge some of these companies more more money than I was comfortable with at the time, but you know, but you know that yeah, was totally, <laughs> yeah. But it was it was good, you know. I think, and we we kept these clients for a long time. At the beginning, the challenge was that you know let's we had 5k or 10k MRR, and we were capping out at that, and so we could either hire somebody to come in and help, but then the revenue really wouldn't have covered all of the services that we needed. So really, it was kind of a natural progression or incremental, as you said, where we started really just inching up our fees and inching them up and inching them up, but we were also adding more value as we were doing this too. So it wasn't like we're coming in with just bigger numbers. We were able to justify it by, you know, some of the more advanced strategies and frameworks that we execute and we teach, but it really is kind of a incremental kind of evolved thing to just, you know, fill up your client pipeline and then eventually you can start charging more and more. Yeah. So what does the, the process usually look like? I'm going to tell you how I'm picturing it. And then you can tell me if I'm seeing it correctly. So let's say somebody comes to you and they're like, Hey, we want to, you know, grow our user base. We want to get more subscribers to Marvel Strike Force or whatever it is that they're uh, that they're pushing, right? And you guys are like, okay, we're going to come back. We, you build a proposal for how you're going to help them. And then they kind of negotiate with you on that. And then you go from there. While you're answering that, I'm curious, like, are they coming to you with like, we need this and this and this? Or is it just like, hey, we have this goal. Do you have something that fulfills this? How, how does that conversation usually go with the beginning? Is it a, I have this thing I want, or I think I want to go this direction, but I'm not quite sure. Most of them think they know what they want. Okay. So they're like, we need to buy ads on Facebook. We don't have anybody to do that. Or we need to grow on Google search or we need to improve our SEO. And so typically what I like to do is just have a conversation with them. And to your point, Keaton, ask them some of the additional questions, like, what are your goals? Like, let's like back up for a second. Yeah. What are your goals? What are you trying to do? and you know learn what they're trying to accomplish usually during that process we find that they don't just need you know facebook or google they need you know other things that could be interesting as well and so this is a, an opportunity where you can really kind of flush out like a larger scope or think about, you know, basically give them a menu of options. So where we typically shine is that if I can get access to their Facebook or Google account on a read-only basis, then I'm able to pretty quickly find areas of improvement. And the angle that I take in my selling process is that I try to be as helpful as possible. So I, I don't try to like hold things back from them. I will say, here's all the things that I would do in, in if I were, if you hired me, and I would also kind of like answer I sell a little bit, I would say, and if you want to take this list and do this in-house, that's totally fine. But mm. when I would give them the list, it's pretty complex in terms of how to execute it and it's time consuming. And almost all of them will go, okay, this makes sense. Okay. We don't really have anybody to do this. So let's talk pricing. And so then that's where we go into the pricing. And then, you know, that can be percentage of spend. It could be a retainer. It kind of just depends on the situation, but usually it starts. So just to recap, it starts out as this, they, 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 they think they know what they want. We talk about their larger goals. Mm. 
figure out, we give them kind of a, tell them a menu of options. We do an audit, we refine that a little bit more, and then they uh, hopefully sign the deal. Cool. And what about if you're doing outbound, like, do you have, first of all, what percentage of deals that you've closed have been from outbound versus a referral or inbound? And then how does that change the sales process for you? Yeah, I'd say right now, probably 20 to maybe, maybe a quarter of our deals uh, are outbound. Most of them are inbound. And with outbound, we have uh, quite a few different templates and, you know, things that I've tried over the years that have, have, have worked. The key is really just being as helpful as possible, like I mentioned. So really with, let's take one company called backgroundchecks.com, which is owned by Higher Right, a large public company. The way that we closed them is that I found somebody in-house that was running their uh, their paid search. And I basically emailed him. It's somebody who was like a colleague from like a long time ago. I emailed him, hey, I noticed that you guys aren't ranking for these keywords. This is how I would do it. Can you connect me to your SEO person? And he's like, we actually don't have an SEO person, but we have another person that might help you. Yeah. But the whole time, every single touch point I had, I was being as helpful as possible. So I was trying to like always offer value as much as possible. In the past, I was scared of doing that because I thought, okay, well, if I just a offer them all this value, then they're just going to take that and just do it in house. But almost all the time, they are one, appreciative of this. And two, they just don't have the resources to execute any of this stuff anyway. So yeah. the key is just to be as helpful as possible. Yeah, I love it. I'm feeling this like kind of shift across all marketing that I'm seeing at where it's talking about saving time instead of saving money. When you're speaking to big executives, you're speaking to big companies, like that's their most scarce resource. And if you can bring in a framework that saves them two years of trying to build it themselves, like that's worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. That funny thing you mentioned that because there's like one specific reporting template that funny enough, people at Amazon where Alan came from were, were similarly using. And then one of our other clients, uh, Shopify, is using a fairly similar template. And that template we found, it's it's like you look at it and you're like, okay, maybe it's not too, super special, but it allows you to, to digest your information so quickly mm. that everybody, when they see this, they love it. So we take that same template that we learned a long time ago and we build that into our own reporting analytics platform called Alpha. And we show them this and it's just, a, it's just an easy way to digest information. So that's one thing we've learned, Keaton, is executives, like you said, they don't have much time. So you mm -hmm. need to have the most concise and clear way of, of showing information to them. And that's one thing that we've learned having worked with all these big companies over the years. Got it. So when you're doing outbound, it's almost always a like custom value pitch where you've done your research, you film a screen recording of like, hey, this is how I would help you or hey, this is what you could do. Maybe not even with a pitch at all, but just the value, custom value, right? You're not like sending out automated LinkedIn messages saying like, hey, I can help you grow your user base with your software or whatever it is, right? Yes, that's exactly okay. right. And and that could still work, but my, you know, these companies that we're dealing with, you know, they're spending tens of thousands of dollars a month on your fees, if not more. Yeah. We close one of these guys, it's potentially millions of dollars. And so- yeah. Me, I'm very hyper targeted. So the way I'll, I'll do it, for example, I'll go through my LinkedIn. A lot of times, if there's somebody in my feed that has maybe changed a job, that's usually a good time to like hit them up or if they need something, and then or give them advice. It's like, oh, I noticed that you're leading paid search or Facebook ads at this new company. By the way, I was looking at your ad library and I noticed all these things here. Here's how I might approach that. And often you're gonna get a way better response rate by doing yeah. that than spamming them with like. I mean, I get spammed all the time by other service providers looking to provide my agency with. With, you know, X, Y, and Z. And it's, I just can't believe that, you know, how unpersonalized half these messages are. I'm sure you get some too. So yeah. it's really like, since these, if you want to close the big clients, you've got to spend the time to do the audit or maybe take five minutes out of your day to like, look at their search profile, look at their Facebook ads, look at what their competitors are doing and give them like three quick actionable tips. Our sample size is not massive because we're doing this to only the big companies, mm -hmm. but it's probably 10, if not hundred X your conversion rate that you're going to close these deals a lot more if you personalize the message to them. Absolutely. I love it. That you mentioned earlier, Dave, that I just want to uh, double click on here, which is like, there's a misconception with agency owners that I found when, in my conversations with them that, you know, these in-house growth teams or these in-house marketing teams, they have all the resources they need. Uh, you know, if we already have a marketing team, why would we need to hire an agency to help us? Right. And so, you know, in my experience, what I've seen is that a lot of these uh, kind of big corporations, and I only have like, I guess my, my experience is only limited to 
Amazon and Microsoft. So, you know, what I've seen is that even though you're working for a big name that, you know, obviously is a household name, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have unlimited resources. In fact, a lot of times their resources are getting scrutinized even more. And so that's even more of a reason for them to go find outside help. Because I can tell you on, on our team, like there was maybe like one or two people that were focused on driving leads for the business, right? And so they would have to lean on agencies to go and help them with that, with the execution. And so on the in-house marketing side, you would actually be focused more on just strategy, finding the target audience, but then you would have to go out and go get an agency to go and help you. And so oftentimes as a smaller agency owner, you know, you can actually have the advantage at winning over these bigger companies by being more helpful, like the things that Dave have talked about, because the conception actually that, you know, we had internally was like, look, these big, these big um, multinational agencies, they have all these resources and all these people like, you know, they actually aren't giving us the time and attention that we want. They're not hungry for our business. And so I would often go and hire smaller agencies because they were hungrier for the business. Right. And so Mm -hmm. there's actually an advantage there that not a lot of people talk about. That's so cool. That is a good one. Yeah. I mean, we kind of act as an extension to those in-house teams, you know, so we don't really replace them as an agency, but to Alan's point, it's like at Amazon, you guys needed, you know, all kinds of different people to actually execute these things. And I'm guessing it wasn't very easy to scale up and scale down Amazon headcount, but bringing on agencies was a lot easier and faster, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I I love that as well. Cause I mean, the average, you know, tech bro that graduated has a marketing degree like probably has never even touched these ad platforms before and might be trying to do their best but really just spinning their wheels trying to figure out how to do their job and agencies who have worked with tons of different brands and actually have the real world experience getting brought in to that relationship makes a lot of sense just from a learning and like an actual practical we can do this perspective really need to make that internal champion you know mm-hmm. smarter help them hit their goals find out what their goals are. One question we ask is what would make your boss happy? Knowing that is very important. And so you can optimize toward that. And it's it's not like a game. It's it's, it's literally what we want to be doing. It's like you want to make their boss happy because that their boss is wanting to hit certain goals. And a lot yeah. of times their goals are tied to, bo- to bonuses as well. So our job is to make them look good and them to, to execute or to help them hit their goals. And then, you know, that keeps us on board a lot longer too. Yeah. So that's kind of brings me to my next question, which is who on these teams are you typically working with? Like, are you actually talking to the CEO and in some time and some cases, or is it mostly like lower level people kind of looking for an agency to bring in who report to a boss who also reports to another boss? And how many people on an, any given team are you coordinating with at any given time? Yeah. So the most common role is a VP of marketing or a VP of growth. That's like the number one role that we're communicating with. And then it's either that person's direct boss, which is usually the CMO or their direct reports, which are a director of growth or a director of paid search or Facebook. Facebook ads. So usually it's the VP of growth that we're, we talk to, and then we're communicating on an executive level basis. Like, so I'll have either weekly or monthly calls with them or quarterly in some cases. And then on their team, we're talking to three to five people typically everywhere from like a creative person to a Facebook person to Google ads to, and by the way, there is overlap again, you know, I mentioned we're extension of their team. So there are people that are kind of doing what we're doing, mm-hmm. but we're just accelerating we're helping them, you know, yeah. move faster, or we're handling some of the, you you know, the tedious things that they don't want to do. And that's totally fine with us. You know, we're, we're happy to do that. But really, it's like making sure that that VP of marketing is hitting his or her goals. And then all the working on the day to day tactical stuff with the people below that person. Got it. And your team, you mentioned 15 people. Are those all full time, like salaried employees? Yep. We've cool. got another three to five contractors, I would say. Mm-hmm. As well. So yeah, you're looking at like 15 to 20 kind of people in, in individual names who are in our Slack and our Rome, a couple other platforms as well. So got it. And I assume having a team like that, like a big part of that is being able to rely on them to actually make the correct decisions. Like a lot of these, yes, there's frameworks. Yes, there's things to accelerate the process, but a lot of it is like critical thinking, like, okay, let's take a look at this brand. And it's not just about like monkey see monkey do, I'm going to take the framework and plug it in. It's like, oh, well, in this case, it might actually be a little bit different. How have you gone about hiring and training people to think the correct way about these kinds of issues? Yes. 
Our hiring process is be a little bit long because we go into very, a lot of big details about, you know, everybody's background and things that they've done and really just going really deep into that. And then yes, our onboarding process, it's like 60 to 90 days of us just like intensely training them. And so in our course, Apex Growth Method, you know, that's a lot of what we teach, by the way, is, is all the same stuff that we're doing internally to service these big brands. And so, you know, those first 60 to 90 days, it's like understanding our frameworks, understanding our processes, getting really, really deep in particular client work. We have something that we use for every single client called a DACI. It's a driver, approver, contributor, and informed. And what we do is we take those four roles and we slice it by all the different work streams that we're doing. So for example, mm -hmm. somebody is doing the Facebook ads strategy, another person doing the Facebook ads tactical work, and then somebody else is doing Google ads, somebody else is doing a creative strategy, creative ideation. All of these things, you have somebody driving it, you have somebody approving that, and then somebody else contributing it, and then there's other people who are informed. And by outline Finding that very clearly on a per client basis or a per project basis, everybody is really clear on what they need to do and like where their swim lanes are basically. Yeah. And so we do that with all of our clients. We do that with all of our people and it just makes it like really, really clear. That's cool. And are there specific people that are always drivers or always tactical or do they kind of cross train and do different things for different clients? Yeah, they definitely kind of a mix. So okay. you have some people who are doing the strategy who are driving it. And then the person doing tactical is contributing on that because they might need to contribute back to that. But then the tactical person is executing, he's, they're driving, but then that strategy person might be an approver on that because they came up with the strategy. So it's a it's a wide mix of, of different mm -hmm. things, but it works really well for us because we have to be able to define very clearly people's roles in their swim lanes. And this is just one of the many frameworks that we've developed or, or at least, you know, adopted over the years that, again, we teach in our course as well. Yeah, no, I think it's uh, one of the things that one of the other benefits of this is that setting proper expectations, especially with a larger enterprise brand is so important because you can lose your shirt or eat into your margins if that's not properly done. And so so having that level of granularity is also a good way of communicating to your clients that you understand the full picture, not only what we're responsible for as the agency, but also what the individual stakeholders are responsible for on their end. And it also helps you stand out as an agency and a service provider too, because not a whole lot of other agencies are doing that, or at least to the rigor that we've incorporated. Yeah. And by the way, this also protects against scope creep. I'm sure mm. you're familiar with that, Keaton. You know, having yeah. a, being an agency owner, it's like you want to yeah. be very clearly define who's doing what. And all, oftentimes in my scopes that I write, I'm also putting directly saying what's out of scope. So I'll say we can ideate with you on different landing page concepts, but we are not going to be coding them. We are not going to be developing them. Your team is responsible for that. Another thing that we've learned as well is it defining really quickly with a, a DACI, for example, or a, a scope is we had some confusion in the past because we weren't clearly defining the creative strategy piece. One client was like, oh, I thought creative production was included in that, as in you guys are going to be making the videos yeah. and assets. And this was partially our fault because we didn't really spell it out as clearly as we should have. So again, you know, now fast forward to 2023, we've learned all of these different frameworks and processes largely because of the mistakes that we've made. And that's what we, you know, give our clients and we teach as well. Yeah, I love that. It seems like the team structure allows you to be very nimble, you know, pick people out, put them back in, kind of plug a, a team that makes sense together for every client that comes on board. And that expectations piece, I love defining what you're not going to do. That's really, that's gold right there. I want to ask one more quick question that I want to dive into why you guys are getting into education, uh, because I think it's really cool, not just because the education is so unique, but because the reason why you're doing it is also unique. But first, I want to ask, what would you recommend to someone, let's say, you know, they've been in IT or development or, you know, some random career job that they're not totally satisfied with and they want want to go into marketing with zero skills in that arena how would you recommend them to start learning digital marketing to the point where they could close one two three of these clients or potentially even build a big agency in this type of space well the first preface is that with that i'm a little biased because you know i wish that i had known what i know now you know yeah. back then and so i was a little bit cocky when i was younger I, th I, th I figured i could figure it out myself and didn't really need to rely on those other experts but you know now going to conferences and, and talking to people regularly i 
I just wish that I invested like a little bit of money in, you know, education, basically. Yeah. And this could be free education. It could be like, I mean, a lot of the stuff that you do on your YouTube channel is really, really useful because it's, you know, a lot of, a lot of nuggets that you can gather that you can then quickly apply to your own agency. So, you know, I think spending the time, one, networking, number two, going to conferences, number three, education, like those three things right there, you know, you're going to have a, a bigger leg up than, than people who are just, you know, in their basement, just trying things out by themselves. Yeah. yeah. Like, so that's actually my origin story, I guess, in a way, which is I started off in construction management when I graduated from school, okay. did not have any sort of marketing background whatsoever. And it was actually, I think I saw an ad or something from like Jeff Walker, or like some, one of these like old school, like marketing gurus. Right. And so I, I clicked on it and I was like, oh, this is interesting. And so in my full-time job, while I was at this real estate developer, I would be learning marketing and implementing what I learned in like a side project. Like I started a blog on, you know, how to do job interviews and stuff like that. And through that, I learned how to turn decades into days and I didn't have to go get a fancy degree or anything. And what I learned from all of that was like, you know, you want to model the mindsets from people that are in the top 1%. And, you know, it's basically, it comes down to two things. It's mindset and mechanics, right? And I forgot who said this, maybe it was like Tony Robbins or something, but like he said, like success is determined 80% by mindset and 20% by mechanics. And if you can figure out the right mindset to have, you'll always be able to get uh, mechanics. And so the, the key is to find both of those things. So for me, my path to marketing was actually through coaching programs. It was through courses. In fact, that's actually what led me to landing a job with Amazon in the first place, because I went from going into just doing these side projects myself. I actually had an agency back in 2012, where I was like helping like, you know, car dealers with their marketing and their social media. It's like a haunted house or something in Utah that I helped. Nice. You know, I took a course, I think it was on app building and this was back in 2012 and I like built like 48 apps. And so I took a course on it and it was like, I was at a full-time job at a life insurance company doing marketing there. And then this opportunity came across Amazon for like a contract role. And so I interviewed for it and it was actually because of what I learned from the courses that I took that I was able to land that job and get my foot in the door. The whole land and expand actually applies to your own career as well, which is I landed a contract role, proved my value, and then they gave me a full-time offer. And then fast forward even more, took another course. I was given an opportunity while I was on my team at Amazon to like run paid media. Never did paid media in my life before. At that point, it was just like social and like video. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay, well, I'm now in charge of media buying and I have a budget. Like, how the heck do I do it? So went back to looking up courses online. Nowadays, like there's there's a ton of courses for everything. You just go on Udemy and you can find a ton. But back in those days, there weren't a whole lot. And so I forgot which one I took, but I took a course on it and then ended up um, building out a program and actually used what I learned in the info marketing space, which not a lot of people know this, but I took what I learned from the info marketing space and I built out a program within Amazon that you know, long story short, ended up winning an award from Jeff Bezos himself. I actually shook his hand. He gave nice. me a big shoe, Nike shoe. And it like, it's kind of this kind of Cinderella story in a way, because I wouldn't have gotten there unless I had really invested in my own education and in trying to find and model after people that had already been there. Right. Like again, take turning decades into days. Like that was a big thing for me. And even to this day, I'm always like shopping around for courses and stuff to just up level my knowledge. I love that. So yeah, so that was that's where that came from yeah thanks for that story i think my brother sent me something the other day he's a programmer and he was saying like this programmer coach was comparing the programming industry to being an athlete like you really do have to be the person that's self-educating if you're going to get better positions better opportunities it's not just about what you can put on your resume it's about how you can think and what sort of things that you can work on that other people might not be willing to do and that's all marketing is at the end of the day is just continuing to think about this in a better, higher way that allows you to spin it in a different manner, apply it to a different niche or industry or whatever it is. So really inspiring story. Thanks. That was great. So with the time we have left, let's dive into the education aspect of what you guys are doing at Apex Growth. Tell us about the courses that you have and the purpose behind them. Yeah. Alan, you want to take this one? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we basically have three programs that we've come up with. First 
first one's Apex Client Acquisition, which is all about attracting the right client or bigger clients and streamlining your sales process. The second one is Apex Growth Mastery. This is literally the playbook that Dave and David used for managing over $100 million in ad budget for companies like Marvel Strike Force or Lyft, right? Pluto TV. This is, to be honest, like what drew me away from Amazon. I left my golden handcuff job at Amazon to join working with Dave and David because I wanted to be within proximity of these guys, right? And to learn from them. How do they, how did they manage this properly? How did they take this company literally spending the first acquisition dollar to scaling the business to 300 million a year in two years, right? And so that's what we package in Growth Mastery. And then the third program is Apex Sales Accelerator. And this is basically behind the scenes on what Dave, David, myself, what we do to land clients consistently, keep our pipeline filled. And you know, as well as I do, like sales is an always on thing that there's the tactics that you use today are similar than what they were before, but things are changing with chat GPT and like, you know, all these other agencies buying for the same business strategies need to change. And so that's a program that we offer that's more of ongoing support. You know, if, if there's questions or, or issues that come up, like that's the program where you can have those fleshed out from folks on our team. Love it. Yeah, and I think on the, the sales side, I, I never really thought of myself as like a salesperson or, or sales guy at all, but that's really been one of my main roles in the last few years is getting in front of the big clients, doing the audits, doing the pitches, writing the scopes, doing contracting, all things that, again, I hadn't set out to do the, at the beginning, but I've learned so much in the last three or four years just doing that, especially with my co-founder and talking to these executives at these big companies. And so we've really tried to distill a lot of that in this course and including, for example, you know, I literally include some of the, the email, the original emails that I wrote to Ring and Snapchat and background checks that are in there. I just redact some of the, the names and, and whatnot. And sometimes they're a little cringeworthy because I feel like I've gotten better at it since then, but the same process applies of just being helpful and, and you're going to start to see patterns there. So I really enjoyed that piece, honestly. It's just like the chase, it can take months, but the payoff is worth it when you're able to close these brands. So we really spend a lot of time in self-reflection, you know, analyzing the persuasion and goals of these companies. So that's really been a focus of mine in my career, but also in this course too. Love it. So we've got the sales side and the uh, how do you actually get them results side and the support to to go along with it. Talk to me about why, you know, you guys are super successful. Why share your secrets? Why push it out there? So there is one kind of funny thing that we're doing now. We hadn't really set out to, to do this at the beginning, but as we started sharing a lot of our secrets, so to speak, we ended up finding people who were actually, you know, either fellow agency owners or they worked in-house for like a, a big brand. And we had a couple of people who are like, hey, like, you know, I'm available able to help you guys out as a, you know, contractor or, or whatnot. And you know, as I mentioned, you know, Keaton, early on, we've got about four or five different contractors, most of whom we actually met through programs like this. So yeah. there's one guy who's helping us for I think 25 hours a week, another person for about 10, another person for 15, all on the media buying and creative strategy side. And they came in through, you know, different kinds of courses or networking, or just in general, just being connected to us. So we're kind of building our bench, you know, so to speak especially the people who take the course because we can train them and they know our processes. So they're, they've basically then done that 60 to 90 day onboarding already. And then we can bring them in and, and give them clients. There's been a couple other clients who are kind of on the smaller side for us to work with, but we've referred those out to people who came in through the course too. Of course, like, you know, we want to be out there and, and networking and, learn, and meeting more people, but really it's, it's been kind of interesting to find people who can actually help us and execute on these clients too. You know? Yeah. I love it. Building that roster of people who are doing doing their own thing, succeeding, but you can pull them in for certain projects or pull them in long-term if that's what they want to do. So cool, guys. It's been awesome talking. Is there anything else you want to say about the courses or the programs that you guys have? Yeah, from, from my standpoint, like, and this is just kind of continuing what you just shared, Dave, is like, we're looking for potential partners. We're in growth mode right now as an agency ourselves, right? And so we're looking for partners. We're looking for media buyers. And what we noticed when we were interviewing for these roles is that there's actually a giant gap in terms of knowledge and experience between the types of media buyers you find applying for your jobs. A lot of them, you see two, two camps. One is you got like your click funnels, agency owner, SMB kind of person, nothing wrong with what they're doing, but there's like a limit to what they can do, mm -hmm. especially in the context of managing budgets for large clients. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have VPs of growth, directors of growth for big tech, 
you know, the FANG companies and they're demanding salaries anywhere from like half a million to over a million <laughs> total compensation, right? And there wasn't a whole lot in between there. And so what we saw was an opportunity, you know, with, you know, my experience at Amazon, Microsoft, Dave's experience at, at uh, Experian, David with Disney and Lyft, we just decided to come together and say like, okay, look, we want to support the community. It shouldn't just be like, a, you know, rich get richer, poor get poorer type of thing. And so we wanted to basically up level the community. And so that's why we put together this, this program, this course. And look, if, if people take the program and they decide that, you know, don't want to work with us or partner with us or, you know, be hired by us, that's totally fine. Like it's out there just to help them in their business. And I love Dave's philosophy here in terms of just being helpful. And that's kind of what we're taking with this education route. Yeah, I love it. It's a breath of fresh air to have someone that's trying to elevate the space in general and just like get some really good tactics in the hands of smart people because, you know, there's a lot of mediocre education out there. So I really appreciate what you guys are doing. Yeah, absolutely. Love it. Well, thanks so much. Anyone who's interested in speaking with Alan, he's taking the sales calls. No guarantee he'll be the one on the calls, but anyone interested in any of these courses, you can check out a link below in this video and they'll discuss what's best for you, what might uh, be best at this time or maybe in a future time. I had the opportunity to get on a sales call with Alan and he was very low pressure, very uh, education based. So highly recommend it. And that link will be below this video. Anything else we should mention about that, Alan or Dave, before we go? All good on my end. Yeah, no, good. I really appreciate the time here, Keaton. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much. Appreciate you. Thanks guys. Take care.